If you and he are truly meant to be together, you will find a way. Love Sanditon, so do we. I shall never fall in love. Seems a beastly business. You can now stream every episode. Forgive me for calling unannounced. Oh, it is. Including the brand new final series. May I offer a few words? You should go to him. Fall in love from start to finish. Sanditon. Stream free on ITVX. This Rugby World Cup is impossible to predict. Can South Africa do it again? Operation Grand Slam. Can England prove the doubters wrong? Tartan pandemonium. Roar of expectation from the crowd. The century's reputation is on the line. It's all eyes on the hosts. The Rugby World Cup 2023 kicks off Friday at 6.45 on ITV1 and ITVX. It's like a mulled wine. Can we try it? Yeah. Oh, this is lovely. It smells of orange. Go for it. Go on. Don't pretend. <laughs> I put a spell on you. Oh. <coughs> Gordon, Gino and Fred Viva is Spaniard. Schools in England will have the start of the new term disrupted this week as head teachers are forced to scramble to find alternative spaces, make repairs, or in some cases reinstate remote learning. And there are concerns that the number of schools affected could be far greater than originally thought. More on that in a moment, but first Charlotte Cross has the latest. For thousands of families like this, the start of the school term has been thrown into chaos. Corpus Christi Catholic Primary Academy in Brixton in London is among those forced to at least partially close after being deemed unsafe. It was a shock when, the email, when I saw the email. I was really shocked that, you know, all of a sudden all this problem just like coming up and it's not nice. The aerated concrete in question was used between the 60s and 80s as it was lightweight and cheap. But in 2018, the roof of a school in Kent collapsed without warning, with repeated calls for action since. And this week, the sudden closure of more than 100 schools across the country known to be built with rack. Here, school bosses have come up with a temporary solution. Students in years three and up who are affected will instead have to travel to a different school, St Martin's in the Field, which is around a mile away. I don't know I'm going to cope taking uh, the year two and the year three to another session. It's going to be difficult for me running to this place and running to the other set because it's two different hands. There has been a lot of help, uh, voluntary help from parents uh, living nearby to be able to drop off or to do like combined pick up and drop off. Students from Corpus Christi will have their own dedicated entrance here around the corner from the main building of St Martin's, as well as two dedicated areas inside for lessons, meaning at least parents here won't have to worry about home learning, which will of course be the case elsewhere. Works like this are now getting underway just as the new school year begins. I'm deeply concerned that we're going to see further disruption at the start of the school term. Children have already faced such disruption to their education with the pandemic and then with the industrial action that ministers failed to stop as soon as they should. But the government said it had to act when it did and will pay whatever it costs. We won't take any risks with their children's safety. So when new information comes to light, however awkward or difficult it is, uh, we will act to make sure their children are safe. And safety of children and staff is the primary concern. But the questions for parents now facing a chaotic start to the school year are how long it will take to fix and why it took until now to start. Charlotte, really difficult this for parents and it could get worse before it gets better. It certainly could and almost definitely will. We've seen 104 schools this week, fully or partially closed, and the government has not yet published a full list of all of those considered to be at risk, which means we simply don't know the full scale of the numbers involved. Now, we've seen some reports today which suggest the number could be as high as 7,000, and if that's the case, that's around a third of the total number of schools across the country, some 22,000. Meanwhile, an investigation by ITV News earlier this year found that uh, almost 1,500 schools built between the 60s and 80s didn't even know whether or not they had rack because they simply hadn't checked. So, yes, those numbers could get significantly 
higher. And in the meantime, it's the families such as those I spoke to in my report today who are left worrying about the safety of their children and about how they'll cope with any temporary measures that need to be put in place, whether that's home learning or travelling between two different schools. Absolutely. Thank you. A man has died at a festival in the desert in Nevada, which has turned into a mud bath after torrential rain. People at the nine-day Burning Man festival have been told to stay where they are and to conserve water and food. It could be several days before it's dry enough to leave. As Vincent McAvinney reports, it's very different from the usual experience. For over 30 years, this remote spot in Nevada's Black Rock Desert has hosted a unique annual festival. Over 70,000 Burning Man attendees build a temporary city on this dry and dusty former lake bed. But this year, things are a little different. Instead of the usual dust goggles, it's ponchos and wellies. Torrential rains have turned the vast site into a mud bath. All the activities are shut down. We all slept all night with no house music bumping. Everything stopped because of that. Despite the issues, Angie told ITV News people have banded together. So we... Everything, the mood around camp, everybody's happy, everybody's uh, fed, everybody's pleasant. There, a couple tents got flooded out and they had to move them, but um, everything's fine. We're just kind of waiting for it to dry. Nobody's, everybody knows we're not going anywhere anytime soon. So we're just kind of making the most of it. Now the conditions are so bad, people are being told to shelter in their camps and ration food, water and fuel. That's because rains have blocked routes in and out of the site, with vehicles getting stuck in the clay-like mud. The festival runs on the principle of radical self-reliance, meaning attendees from around the world have to bring their own supplies. No food, water or equipment are sold in this commerce-free space. We're going back. Mother is swallowing <laughs> One man has, though, now died in unknown circumstances. Local police are investigating, and the man's next of kin have been informed. Some posted online saying they'd had to escape the festival on foot, including musician Diplo, who said he walked five miles with comedian Chris Rock before they were picked up by fans. The festival derives its name from the culminating burning of a giant effigy. For those sticking around to see it, this year, the principle of radical self-reliance is being tested to the max. Vincent McAvinney, ITV News. Thousands of homes are without power in Taiwan, where Typhoon Haikui has made landfall. Intense rain and winds are lashing the eastern parts of the country. Almost 4,000 people have been evacuated from high-risk areas and businesses are closed. All flights, rail and ferry services have been suspended and workers have been urged to stay home. After a summer of announcements on stopping the boats, Parliament returns tomorrow with the problem only growing for the government. Yesterday, the number of people trying to cross the channel in small boats reached a new record for the year, with 872 people making the crossing. And our political correspondent David Wood is here. David, there have been plenty of promises from the government on this, but the issue is just not going away, is it? No, it really isn't. Those in government would say that this year, compared to la this time last year, crossings are down by 15%. But still, with a daily record for this year yesterday, the issue isn't going away. The Home Office describes the numbers as unacceptable and they're placing unprecedented strain on the asylum system. This is one of the 15 boats that made that crossing yesterday. As you say, nearly 900 people did. Uh, and that's a fairly calm day in the Channel. But still that boat looks incredibly precarious with so many, around 50 people on it. The government says it's getting tough introducing new laws to detain people when they arrive here and send them to a safe country or their country of origin. Ministers are looking at using fewer hotels as well to house asylum seekers. But one charity that's working with refugees says that those deterrents simply are not working and that the actual only thing that is having any impact on the numbers making the crossing is something ministers can't control. I think the weather has a huge impact on it. In terms of deterrent policies, I think they have almost no impact at all. Because if you're living rough in Calais, you're not reading English newspapers, you're not seeing the media, there's word of mouth and whispers, but you don't know the impact of these policies. You really don't understand them. 
As you say, a new political term gets underway tomorrow. Labour will be sharpening up its attacks in areas it thinks the government should be improving. And I'm told one of them later on in the week is immigration. Don't forget, though, a key promise from Rishi Sunak is to stop the boats. And if yesterday is anything to go by, he's not even close to achieving that. Right, David, thank you. Tesco supermarket boss Ken Murphy is calling for a law change to make abuse or violence towards retail workers an offence. Mr Murphy says physical assaults on staff have risen by a third in a year. He says workers have been offered body-worn cameras and extra security, but more needs to be done against offenders. And Lloyds, HSBC and City are trying to get people who've been working from home since the COVID pandemic back into the office. City have now started monitoring how often its UK staff come in and could cut bonuses if they don't come in at least three days a week. And two of England's biggest clubs faced off today in the Premier League as Arsenal took on Manchester United at the Emirates Stadium. Neither side have hit the heights expected of them so far this season. But it was Arsenal who came out on top today with two goals in added time for a 3-1 win. Chris Scudder was watching. A new anthem for the red part of North London, but it wasn't the fans who needed auto-tune. Arsenal striker Kai Havertz hit a flat note with the goal at his mercy. Martinez amongst chaos. United's players looked as unfamiliar with each other as their green and white stripes until, out of nothing... It's Rashford! A classic counter-attack for an undeserved lead. But it lasted less than two minutes. The Arsenal captain carrying on where he left off last season. Then Havertz went down and thought he'd won a penalty only for the referee to change his mind. Then late drama. United thought they'd won it in the dying moments through Garnacho, only for VAR to intervene again offside. It looked destined for a draw until the sixth minute of stoppage time and Arsenal's £100 million man, Declan Rice, repaid some of his huge transfer fee with a winning goal. And a third goal followed, 3-1 to Arsenal. Chris Scudder, ITV News. In Scotland, champion Celtic won the first Old Firm derby of the season. They won 1-0 at Ibrox thanks to a goal late in the first half from Japanese striker Kyogo. The victory takes Celtic to the top of the Scottish Premiership table. Max Verstappen has made Formula One history, winning a record-breaking 10th consecutive race at the Italian Grand Prix. The Dutchman was held back by Carlos Sinz's Ferrari for 14 laps before eventually taking the lead at Monza. Finally, this week will mark the first anniversary of the death of Queen Elizabeth II. But how should the late monarch be remembered? A committee has been set up to decide and they'll take suggestions from members of the public, as Jay Akbar reports. How do you sum up a life that's measured in eras? From the young queen to the symbol of stability she became. That job to come up with a permanent tribute falls to the Queen Elizabeth Memorial Committee. The question is, what tribute will be fitting enough for a life so immeasurable? Well, to try and answer that, the committee is going to ask the general public for suggestions. It's not a bad idea. And surely we can do better than statue. I think we need a Queen's statue somewhere. Yes, yeah, statue a is statue, forever. Yeah. People can go and see it. And it's not going to, it's permanent. I would want a statue where she is on, like, on top with her crown. An excellent point, but just for variety. Yeah, and some kind of mural or something of things that she's. A mural, a mural's different because we've had statue about 17 times today. <laughs> <laughs> but that, you could tell kind of the story of her life. And as we all know, everyone has their favourite Queen Elizabeth era. I think her younger self, when she first Ooh. up, because she came Queen so young. Not the younger version, because the kids don't know her younger self. Although I would have gone older self, but that's what, only because that's what we knew. And what did you think of her when she was older? I really liked her because of the nice outfits she wore. In her later years, I mean, she was just a, a monument on her own. So much so, she unveiled her own father, King George VI Memorial, in 1955 and the Queen Mother's half a century later. Any version would be fitting, but the big question is, will a future memorial include her beloved corgis? 
Jay Akbar, ITV News. And that is all for now. We're back with the late news at 10. Until then, goodbye.